So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bolus Kür, and I'm the scientific vice president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. Uh, I have recently joined the board of the EFCE, and it's an honor for me to serve the chemical engineering community in this role. As a scientific vice president, it is my role to support our scientific groups, meaning the uh, working parties and sections. Um, and uh, in our work to support the chemical engineering community throughout Europe and the world, uh, as well as the wider community that makes use of the chemical engineering inventions that we all pursue. I'm a chemical engineer by training, and I grew up in the north of the Netherlands. I graduated from the University of Groningen. And in the past uh, 12 and a half years, I've been working at the University of Twente, where I'm now a full professor in sustainable separation technology. Next to my academic professorship, I'm also a program director um, in the cluster on separations for circularity at the uh, Institute of Sustainable Process Technology in the Netherlands. This is an institute where academia and industry meet. And this is a great example, which matches also the EFCE, where we see that in our working parties and sections, we have activities from uh, industrialists and from academia. And the work together between academia and industries is very important to pursue future uh, new developments in the field of chemical engineering. As such, I really would like to emphasize that we should strengthen our ties between industry and academia and not abandon these ties, as maybe some activists would like to see. I think we really need the joint effort to make the world more sustainable and to develop new and um, environmentally friendly solutions, such as uh, developing solutions for clean water, what we will see today. Let me say a little bit about uh, the webinar series. The EUCE is organizing uh, this online series of uh, lectures in significant topics in chemical engineering since the year 2020. This was the pandemic year uh, and the success of the previous years has made us to uh, decide to continue on this and to host every year um, this series. Next to meetings in person, such as the European Conference on Chemical Engineering, which will be held again next year in Lisbon, and also the, the working party and section meetings in person. And this online series is an excellent opportunity to exchange knowledge and to gather the latest information from our um, working parties and sections. So this year we have activities from the working parties and sections, including the thermodynamics, membranes, uh, education, static, statistic, static electricity, um, drying, fluid separations, loss prevention, crystallization, process intensification, uh, chemical reaction engineering, food. And today we will start with a contribution by the membrane engineering section on desalination. During these two weeks, we have 11 uh, sessions of three or four talks on specific topics with leading industrial and academic experts. And link to these next talks are available where you were also finding uh, the link to this session. Um, and you can register for the other events as well. The EFCE promotes scientific collaboration and supports chemical engineers in European countries uh, representing more than 100,000 chemical engineers in Europe. And our working parties and sections cover all the major topics in chemical engineering. So before finalizing, I would like to uh, thank all the people who have contributed to these uh, sessions, and uh, in particular today, the speakers of today in the chair, Alessandra Criscoli, and of course, Martina Pu, who has organized the whole series. For now, I would like to hand over the word to uh, Alessandra Criscoli from the uh, Institute of Membrane Technology to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, and welcome everybody to this spotlight talk on challenges and opportunities in desalination. And um, my name is Alessandra Criscoli, and I'm a researcher at the Institute of Membrane Technology in Italy. And I'm pleased to give you some information on this spotlight talk. 
As you may know, today desalination plants are based on the reverse osmosis units, and the reverse osmosis is a membrane applications, membrane operation, which is able to produce fresh water starting from salty water. So it's very important in this period of, the, of, of we are experiencing. However, the water recovery factors of the reverse osmosis is usually around maximum 50%. This means that together with fresh water, also a very highly concentrated stream, uh, concentrated in salt, which we call brine, is produced. And actually, this brine is just re-injected back into the sea with some impacts on the marine env environment. So as we expect that in the future, next future, desalination plants will uh, uh, further increase due to the increasing continuous demand on uh, fresh water. Um, the, the management of this brine in a more sustainable way is becoming really an urgent matter. And in this webinar, we would like to um, propose some possible strategies to um, handle this uh, brine in a more sustainable way rather than just re injecting back into the sea. And in this uh, respect, we will have today three um, uh, lectures um, trying to propose some possibilities to exploit the brine producing the salination plants, and also uh, giving you some information about the energy um, uh, related to this uh, exploitation, so the uh, energy requirements in this, in this case. And uh, I take the opportunity to thank the speakers uh, who have accepted our invitation and uh, to be here and to share with us their experience in the field. And um, also, I would like to, um, to um, thank all of you for, for being here to, to attend and I hope you will enjoy the, the seminar. I'm sure they, they, it will be fruitful. And um, uh, finally, I would like also to inform the participants that uh, for any questions, you cannot directly talk with the speakers, but uh, in the webinar, you, you must type your uh, question into the chat and then we will, uh, after this lecture, we will uh, pass your question to the speaker. Oh, uh, we can move to the other presentation, and uh, I'm pleased to introduce the next speaker. Um, she is a uh, Dr. Francesca Macedonio from the Institute of Memory Technology in Italy, and uh, she will also present uh, the possibility of using memory crystallization uh, to exploit somehow the brine produced in the in desalination. So, uh, Francesca, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alessandra, for the introduction. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, thanks a lot. Yes, in my presentation, I would like to discuss about the possibility to recover some metals from the brine of the salination plants, and in particular, some very um, uh, important metals uh, at the moment. As uh, all of us uh, know, uh, raw materials are important for the development of every society because they are uh, 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 important for the development of every society. But some of uh, these raw materials are of particular concern because in terms of secure and sustainable supply. Then the European Union every three years carries out an, a critical assessment on a wide uh, range of uh, uh, raw materials and list the critical raw materials. For 2023, we have a list of 34 critical raw materials and among these we have rare earth and lithium. What about lithium? Well, lithium uh, is uh, the symbol of the electrification process and strongly affect the transportation sector. As we know, the most part of lithium comes from the triangle between Argentina, Bolivia and Chile. And the forecast indicate that by 2035, the demand of lithium will supply will overcome the supply. 
Another uh, alkali metal with a high economic potential is rubidium because it is used in laser technology and optic telecommunication. His uh, market is growing very fast because for 2022, the global rubidium market was estimated at around 500 million dollars and it is expected to grow until one billion dollar by the end of 2027. Well, where we can find raw materials? As we know, sea water mining has been already identified as a promising option for the extraction of valuable compound. And in fact, sea water contains so many organic and inorganic components that it is called liquid polymetallic ore. As we know, sodium chloride is the most common uh, minerals extracted from seawater, but actually also many other salts such as potassium salts, bromine and iodine are extracted from seawater. Which is the new strategy? The new strategy is to try to um, extract uh, compound from the desalination brine. Um, desalination is a very common and successful uh, um, separation uh, technology uh, that we can find worldwide. Each day around 100 million cubic meters of fresh water are produced worldwide. And the most part of this fresh water is produced via reverse osmosis technology. In this technology, we have a dense membrane and the water is forced to pass through this dense membrane uh, through the use of pressure. The problem is that in the base uh, of the cases, reverse osmosis has a recovery factor of, of about 50%. What does it mean? This means that from one liter of seawater, half a liter is produced as drinking water and half a liter as brine. Uh, the brine is the very high concentrated solution discharged from the desalination plant. Well, the, the idea is to, is to try is to, uh, try to uh, um, exploit the added value of this arrow brine through new technology. And I will talk about membrane crystallization, which, which is just an extension of membrane distillation. This process allows us then to reduce the volume of reverse osmosis brine discharged in the environment. So improving the sustainability of the salination plant and trying to recover more fresh water and salts from these streams. Just a few words about membrane distillation and membrane crystallization, because already introduced by uh, Patricia. In um, membrane distillation, we have an hydrophobic uh, microporous membrane. Uh, at feed side, we have a hot liquid solution. In our case, this hot feed will be um, the reverse osmosis brine. The hydrophobic nature of the membranes prevents the penetration of the liquid through the membrane. Therefore, only volatile components can pass through the membrane and are recovered on permeate side. Considering that the, that the feed is a reverse osmosis brine, then the feed will contain water and ions, uh, the most part are ions, so only water vapor will pass through the membrane and are recovered at permeate side. Uh, membrane crystallization is uh, just an extension of this process because we will have that at feed side, the solution will be more and more concentrated due to the evaporation of the solvent, then at feed side we can achieve supersaturation 
and then nucleation and crystals formation. This process has various advantages with respect to conventional process that can be used for performing a similar uh, process. In particular, we have rejection of uh, almost 100%. This means that we can have a very high purity water on permeate side. And uh, moreover, in the case of membrane crystallization, we have that uh, the solvent transmembrane flux can be regulated very precisely through the proper choice of membrane structure and uh, operating condition. Because depending on uh, pore size, membrane porosity and the temperature and pressure of uh, the process, we can regulate a solvent uh, transmembrane flux. This means that we can regulate the supersaturation rate and then finally um, the formation of the crystals nuclei. Uh, in this process, we have also a strong contact between the feet and the membrane, the membrane surface, uh, due to the um, fact that the liquid solution is in contact with the membrane surface. And we have to think about this when we have to perform this process. Well, membrane crystallization has been already uh, proved to be a good option to extract component from brine and from other various types of wastewaters. And in fact, it, an, it has been already used in the past for the extraction of sodium chloride and epsomite from the brine streams of the desalination plant. It has been used for the extraction of sodium sulfate as tenardite from wastewater streams. And we can found various work in literature proving as it can be used for extraction again of sodium chloride from uh, produced water. That is the wastewater from the oil and gas industries. Where uh, today I would like to show how uh, member crystallization can be used for the extra for the crystallization of lithium chloride and rubidium chloride. These are uh, two uh, very particular components because, as already explained, are of high economic interest. But um, these two components are not so easy to crystallize because both of them high, are highly reactive and uh, both of them have a, a very high solubility. Therefore, the first step was to try to determine the condition for the crystallization of the single compound. And therefore, the first test were performed to try to find the best uh, membrane crystallization configuration and the operating conditions and the membrane that can be used for the crystallization of these two compounds. Um, for example, in the case of lithium chloride, we can uh, we try all the different uh, possible configuration. I mean, direct contact, higher gap, sweeping gas, vacuum, membrane crystallization, and osmotic membrane crystallization for trying to achieve the lithium chloride crystallization. But due to its very high solubility, that was around 40 molar, at 20 Celsius degree, some of these configurations uh, were not useful to achieve this uh, our high the crystallization of lithium chloride. Here are what happened, for example, in the case of direct contact membrane distillation. What we can see, for example, at 50 Celsius degree is that we cannot achieve concentration higher than more or less 8 molar because at this very high concentration, the osmotic 
effect on the feed side overcome the thermal effect and therefore uh, we cannot achieve higher concentration then we cannot achieve the 14 molar uh, necessary to have the lithium chloride crystallization we can try to increase the temperature for having an higher concentration on feed side due to the evaporation of water but as we know Increasing the concentration at, at feed side means also increasing the solubility of lithium chloride. Therefore, the achieving of the crystals remains an, an achievable task. The only possibility is to use, after various uh, tests, is to use vacuum membrane crystallization because in this case we can achieve an higher driving force with respect to the other member crystallization configuration. And in this case, yes, we achieved the decrystallization of lithium chloride working at relatively low temperature around 47 Celsius degree. But what we observed is also that depending on the temperature on feed side, for example, reducing the temperature on the feed side, we will have for sure a longer process, but we can address the morphology of the lithium chloride. In fact, for example, working at higher temperature, we have lithium chloride in its orthorhombic form, whereas at lower temperature, we can achieve lithium chloride in its cubic shape. Um, then we try to see what happened changing the membrane material to check if uh, other uh, material can be used for achieving the lithium chloride crystallization. In the previous test, in the test that I showed before, uh, membrane in polypropylene were used. Then we used also some inorganic membrane, and in particular two different inorganic membrane. The first one is a tubular aluminum membrane hydrophobized with polymethyl silesquioxane and also a capillary a aluminum membrane hydrophobized with fluoroalkacylane. Uh, in both cases, we achieved, we were successful in the in crystallization of lithium chloride. Of course, uh, considering that the two membranes are different, not only in the uh, diameter, but also in the porosity, what we observed was that in the case of the membrane with higher porosity, the capillary one, we had an higher flux, but in any case, both of the membranes were useful for the lithium chloride crystallization. Then we try to see if uh, PVDF can be used also for the crystallization of lithium chloride and tested various membranes or only in PVDF, the commercial one, or some composite membrane, PVDF Iclon. In all the five different tested membranes, we cannot uh, achieve the crystallization of lithium chloride due to irre irreversible wetting. Wetting can occur in um, membrane distillation and membrane crystallization. And usually in the process, when we observe wetting, uh, we wash the membrane, dry the membrane, and the process can be restarted. But in the case of the test with lithium chloride and the membrane in PVDF, this procedure uh, resulted unsuccessfully. Then we try to understand why PVDF membrane cannot be used in the case of lithium chloride. First of all, we did some SEM analysis, but we did not observe any difference between the uh, virgin and tested membrane. Uh, also, EDX analysis uh, do not prove the formation of permanent bond between lithium cations and PVDF membranes. 
But on the contrary, the measurement of contact angle proved that the contact between the membrane, the PVDF membrane, and the lithium chloride solution decrease the contact angle of the membrane. Therefore, uh, there is a sort of chemical interaction between the membrane and the high concentrated solution. This was proved also through the measurement of the surface energy of the membrane through the FOX model. As we can see, in fact, is that the measurement of the surface energy uh, on the tested membrane and its comparison with the virgin membrane prove an increase of the surface energy. Therefore, there is a reduction, a real reduction of the contact angle and of the hydrophobicity of the membrane. And uh, finally, uh, through uh, FTIR and Raman analysis, we uh, were able to prove the modification of the <laughs> surface um, of the membrane uh, that will um, cause the um, unaccessible lithium chloride crystallization via this membrane. What we can see here is the spectra of the virgin membrane, the green spectra, and uh, the, the spectra of the um, tested membrane. What we can see is that it seems that uh, the, the spectra are identical, uh, except for the peak at around 726, uh, which is present on the virgin membrane, but not on the tested membrane. And in fact, Raman analysis proved that in the case of the tested membrane, the red spectra, we can see the formation of an additional peak, uh, which is characteristic of a double carbon-carbon bond. And uh, this is a confirmation of the uh, chemical interaction between the tested uh, membrane and the lithium chloride uh, solution. And in fact, in literature can be found various work proving that uh, while PVDF membrane are stable when in contact with uh, acid solution, the contact with uh, strong solution or with um, highly reactive compound like lithium chloride, uh, cause a dehydrofluorination reaction with expulsion of an HF group and the formation of this carbon-carbon bond. Uh, then the last case study is related to the possibility to crystallize rubidium chloride via membrane crystallization again. And it can happen from the leaching solution that uh, appear during the uh, rubidium chloride uh, process, uh, crystallization process. Uh, our idea is to use uh, membrane crystallization to have the formation of uh, rubidium chloride from this uh, li uh, leaching solution. Um, also okay. here- Francesca, sorry, uh, 25 minutes. Yeah, 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 okay, okay. thank you. Uh, also here, the first step was to uh, find the best configuration and the operative condition and the membrane to achieve the crystallization of lithium chloride. Um, also here, like in the previous case with lithium chloride, we tested the various, uh, various and possible different membrane crystallization configuration, but again, the only possible Configuration is the, the vacuum one due to the same motivation to have an eiger driving force due to the very high solubility of this compound. Then we use the first of all the polypropylene membrane to try to um, see if uh, the rubidium chloride crystallization can be achieved. Uh, here are the results. What we can see is that uh, the flux, which is the red line, uh, the flux uh, was low during all the process, 
but we had almost a constant flux for around 12 hours. After this, we have a decrease, a strong de decrease of flux, and was due to the very high concentration in the plant and due to the fact that we have a lot of rubidium chloride crystals circulating in the plant. Uh, therefore, it, uh, after around uh, 1,000 uh, minutes from the start of the test, we have to um, stop the test, filter the feed solution, remove all the rubidium chloride crystals, and then to uh, re-put the filtered feed solution in the plant to try to uh, continue the process to check if more rubidium chloride crystals can be achieved. In all the tests, all, what we can see was that in any case, the rejection was very high. And here are some pictures of the rubidium chloride crystals as achieved during the test with the polypropylene membrane. What we can see mm, is that the crystals were very good with a coefficient of variation very low, 33%, with it's uh, uh, good if we consider a, a process that can be scaled up. Uh, the coefficient of variation is the parameter which um, give an indication of the distribution of the crystal sides around the average sides, and uh, a value of 33 is uh, really good. Then we try to see if we the uh, PVDF membrane appeared the same problem of lithium chloride. And here again, uh, while with the PP membrane, we can uh, we were successful in the obtaining of rubidium chloride. With PVDF membrane, no, rubidium chloride can uh, were not achieved as crystals. And again, due to the modification of the membrane surface, uh, as proved by the Raman spectra again, with the formation again of the double carbon-carbon bonds. Then, in conclusion, from all the work done, what we can see? We can see that uh, for sure membrane crystallization um, as various criticalities, but it can be used for the recovery of compounds from various wastewater streams and from the brine of the salination plants. What is uh, very important is to have, is to find, is to determine the um, good membrane uh, and operating condition and membrane material for performing the process because uh, not only solvent transmembrane flux, but uh, um, the uh, crystallization process itself is strongly affected by the um, solution in contact with the membrane. Um, of course, to be performed uh, to finalize and to complete the process um, because we need uh, uh, not only um, well-performing membrane, but also um, various research activities has to be done to reduce Francesca? Yeah, uh, sorry, I don't know if uh, you can hear me. I yes, uh, I can hear you, but I cannot. Can you hear, hear me? Uh, uh, yes, you can you can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yes, yes. Yeah, the only I thing don't know if the presentation was disconnected. Yeah, it was disconnected. Yeah, we we can we cannot see the your uh, your uh, screen your presentation, but we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Good. Now you can. Now, now we see, see it again. Yes. Okay. Can see it again. Okay. I don't know where I was disconnected. 
Uh, yeah, in the conclusion, I, I was yes on the on the conclusion. Yes. Uh, sorry, Alessandra, where uh, my presentation was disconnected. At the conclusion. Has been Can you hear ah, the me? conclusion? The conclusion. Yes. Yes. Okay. Then that this process can be really um, uh, used for the crystallization and for the extraction of valuable compound from various wastewater streams. And what is um, really important is to uh, determine the optimum operating condition and membrane crystallization configuration for achieving uh, the process. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for he, um, hearing me, and I will be very uh, happy to answer to your question. And sorry for the disconnection. No problem, Francesca. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for the interesting presentation. Uh, this is another way we can think uh, uh, for managing in a more sustainable way the highly okay. concentrated brines. And uh, I see there is a, um, uh, a question for you. Uh, good morning. Thanks for the nice presentation. My question is, did you have any fouling issues? Can you hear me? OK. Ah, yes, sorry. Did um, I think there is delay? Well, uh, until yeah, okay. now? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes, we observed the uh, fouling issue. And in fact, in, uh, when I show the presentation, in particular in the uh, crystallization of rubidium chloride, um, we uh, observed the um, uh, uh, the fouling when uh, not on, uh, when in particular um, very high concentrated are achieved on feed side and in fact uh, during the process we had to um, stop the plant to remove all the crystals circulating in the plant and then to uh, restart the test. Then, yes, both sculling and fouling are some of the criticalities of this process and where we have to work on, but um, can be minimized through a proper pretreatment of the feed solution, for example, all through um, uh, choosing the proper uh, operating condition. But yes, both sculling and fouling are observed uh, during the process. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know if there are other questions you can type, then I will pass to Francesca. Maybe not. So maybe also as Patricia, if you have any direct questions to pose to Francesca, she I think she would be pleased to to reply. And uh, okay, thank you again, Francesca, for the nice uh, presentation. And then we can now it's time to move to the last speaker of our uh, morning session. And uh, I'm pleased. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think there is delay in the line. So maybe I don't know if it's my problem or your problem, but now we, we fix it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm really pleased to introduce the, the, the last speaker, last but not least speaker of our morning session, uh, Dr. Guillermo Saragossa uh, from CMAT, Plataforma Solar de Almeria in Spain. He will also, he, he, sorry, he will also talk about desalination plants, but specifically from uh, energetical point of view, he will talk about the solar energy and how we can use it in the desalination plants. So thank you, uh, Guillermo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Alessandra, for the presentation. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this um, webinar. Yes, I will talk about the combination of solar energy with desalination. Um, if this works, uh, I'm sorry. I'm... Okay, 
Yes, well, first, uh, an introduction. I come from uh, Plataforma Solar de Almería. is in the southeast corner of, of Spain. We are a solar energy research center, mostly focused on production of energy from solar radiation. We have a lot of, uh, we are large solar, uh, a large research infrastructure, and we have a small uh, department working on water desalination. Uh, we have actually become a sustainable desalination living lab with the objectives of decarbonizing desalination, implementing circular economy in desalination, using seawater as a source of scarce materials, and the general aim of improving water energy food nexus in arid regions. Desalination is a separation process where feed water, which can be seawater or brackish water, is turned into a water product, distillate or permit, depending on whether the separation units uses membranes or other uh, thermal separation means, and uh, a rejected water, which is the concentrated brine. Of course, this process needs energy. And depending on the separation process, the energy will be thermal, mechanic, or, or even an electric potential. Uh, worldwide capacity is increasing exponentially. You can see that the industry is booming and more than 100 million uh, cubic meters are desalinated daily. This uh, has uh, some energy requirements. This was uh, an estimation we made several years ago. Uh, so the total energy requirements for desalination were about 200 terawatt hour uh, of electricity per year. And uh, this has some associated CO2 emissions, 120 megatons per year. So it's clear that uh, if we see the regions with water shortages are the ones in the dark red color here, compared to the regions with high solar radiation, this coincidental, uh, geographic coincidence lead us to consider solar desalination as the solution for sustainable desalination and to avoid the CO2 emissions associated to this increasingly expanding uh, industry. Solar energy can be thermal or photovoltaic. Photovoltaic energy can be used for mechanical vapor compression, reverse osmosis, or electrodialysis. In the first two cases, we turn electricity into uh, mechanical power. In the third one, we use electricity directly. Photovoltaic, photovoltaic effect is the conversion of solar uh, light into electricity in uh, semiconductors. Free electrons are created by the absorption of photons in a layer of a semiconductor, and these photons, these electrons can migrate through an external circuit to the consecutive layer to create an electric current. This is a well-known principle that occurs in a cell. Similar cells are connected in series to form a PV module. And PV modules are connected in series or parallel to assemble a solar panel. I presume you're all familiar with solar panels. The, depending on the connection of the PV modules, they can have a certain current and voltage. But solar panels are made of modules and modules are made of cells. The efficiency of cells is increasing uh, with research. In the last years, uh, there are some uh, very advanced research cells uh, that have reached 47 or even more uh, percent of efficiency. This multi-junction cells, the more standard commercial crystalline silica cells are in the range of 25, 27%. But modules are slightly lower, so have slightly lower efficiency. Commercial modules are about 20% efficiency. Of course, there are improved modules with using gallium and arsenic that exceed 30%. And uh, even the hybrid four junction modules have reached more than 40%. But yeah, commercial modules are around 20% efficiency. The cost is decreasing constantly. In the last 11 years, the levelized cost of electricity produced with PV has been decreasing by about 17% on a year-to-year -year basis. Now the global weighted, well, that was the figure from 21, the global weighted average levelized cost of electricity for large PV systems was about 4 cents per, uh, euro per kilowatt hour. Of course, there are cheaper cases. Uh, so the minimum, I think, is about two cents. 
Um, but there is a limitation with the use of, of PV uh, energy because of the variability of solar irradiance. Let me show you this very simple uh, uh, diagram showing that, of course, the sun rises and sets, and it's never constant. So the solar irradiance is always changing during a day, even if there are no clouds at all, just because of the relative movement of the sun around the Earth and the absorption of the atmosphere and the inclination of the angle. And we define the peaks and hours as the area, this area of all the changing solar irradiance. So normalized by a thousand watts per square meter. So it's the equivalent, the number of hours in which the solar irradiance reaches an average of one kilowatt per square meter. So it's turning this area below this curve into this square. And the peaks and hours are depending on the, on the, of course, on the day, or depending on the season, depending on the position, the, the latitude and the, the place you're in, is four, five, maybe six hours, best case. So that's the amount of, of, of radiation that we can use. You can see that here, this is the production of PV in a clear day, the, the red curve. Of course, the blue one is on a cloudy day with a lot of variation, but let's choose a perfect day this is what we can produce. So of course it's never stationary. And when we want to feed a desalination process with a constant power, we see that if we install the peak power suited to the desalination process, you only have the peak power at midday, the very top of the, this curve. And the rest is here. This is the surface, the area, of the total power that we can use with PV. So the, this is called the capacity factor, the total energy that PV can supply. In this case, it's less than 30%. So that's the what we can get from PV for desalination. The rest, we would have to take it from the grid. So now there are lots of desalination plants saying, oh, we're going to install PV panels to decarbonize our system. Well. It's hard because of the low capacity factor of PV. One solution can be to increase the size of the PV field. Like in this case, the peak is much larger than the power demand, the peak of the demand. And then you can guarantee that at least during this time, you, have, you are covering the required uh, power. So by having excess peak installed, excess PV capacity installed, you have you can supply during, I don't know, what is this, four or five hours, enough power for the desalination in a stationary and constant way. But then all this excess power, all this energy produced during this time is, is lost unless you store it. And that's what, what is done when you overdimension the PV field to have enough power during a certain time, then all this excess energy is stored and used before and after. So we extend the operational time by using batteries. That way we can increase the capacity factor of PV and use more solar energy. In this case, I think we can reach 50%. But then we have to use more panels, a larger field and use batteries to store the energy. So that's how the systems uh, are um, implemented in, in real life. We have a PV, this is an example of a PVRO uh, system. The PV panels are feeding a rack of batteries and the pumps of the, P, of the RO system take the energy from the batteries. So batteries are essential, but they are very expensive and they are also contaminant because they use uh, uh, rare materials that are hard to recycle. And are expensive as well. So, okay, there are commercial systems based on the use of batteries. Uh, PVRO started in the, the beginning of this century, and uh, this is a, perhaps one of the first patents by the uh, Technology Institute of Canary Islands in 2004. They made a lot of um, demonstration cases in North Africa, even in the Canary Islands. Now they have improved, they have a, the version 2.0 with uh, very good uh, specific uh, energy consumption, very practical uh, combination. 
again using batteries and the cost of course is the cost of water is increased because batteries are very expensive but also the battery efficiency is rather low because of the uh, charge discharge cycles being very short manufacturers of batteries give 85 percent of efficiency but that's for low uh, very slow discharge charge cycles over 100 hours in the combination of pv and ro we are using less than four hours so the efficiency is decreased to 45 percent and also because of the size motors operate at lower efficiency than in larger plants so we have a problem uh, uh, with efficiency of pbr small pbro systems to uh, improve the efficiency we can use large systems to the, decrease the low efficiencies of the pumps and, and motors use positive displacement pumps that usually give better efficiency and of course use energy recovery systems but typically what everybody wants is to minimize uh, the energy going through batteries so to have as many uh, as, as few batteries as possible and avoid this high charge discharge rates so we're going to see some uh, research done on, on the use of pvro without batteries we can use gravity because we can power we can power pumps to pump water to a certain altitude and that can be directly connected to pv it doesn't need to to be stationary as, um, as opposed to RO, which it needs to operate in a stationary conditions. So whenever you have radiation and with the intensity that you have, you can power uh, the pumps and uh, pump water and then use constant gravity for the high pressure RO pump. And this is done, for, for example, by elemental water makers. They use uh, 90 meters uh, buffer for seawater because they have a very low and energy consumption system because they also operate RO with low recovery to decrease the energy and allow to use low altitude. Otherwise, they would need a much higher altitude to overcome the osmotic pressure. But this has of uh, geographical limitations. You need to have uh, this a hill to to install the buffer and size limitations. You can have a, a very large buffer typically. Um, but they, they have found some case studies and they have some plants in Virgin Islands, for instance. This is a perfect case where you have, the, I think there's how a hotel, so they have the PV panels and the, the arrow plant for the hotel at the bottom of the hill. Modular operation is also a solution, but I'm afraid that the, this looks better in print than in reality, because adjusting the number of arrow modules to the available power is quite complicated to, uh, due to operational issues. You cannot just disconnect the arrow module and stop it because if it, if it gets dried and if it, uh, the salt water stays inside the memories will clog so you need to there is some process of uh, washing out the the module and and leaving it with some uh, water that cannot be done immediately so it's very hard to adapt uh, and device control systems to operate this uh, uh, practically Another option is to just assume that the radiation is changing and operate RO in variable conditions by using variable frequency drives to the pumps and then the pressure is adapted to the available power that you have. And this is what uh, Os uh, Mascara are doing uh, with their Osmosun system. You see that the radiation in a clear day is this, so the pump starts and decrease and this is the pressure. Pressure goes up and goes down and the speed of the pump goes up and goes down relation to the available radiation that means that the flow changes with well, ch flow changes with the speed so the flow is variable this is the solar radiation solar irradiance and the production is not constant it changes with the solar irradiance this is from a demo that they did at uh, arab united arab emirates in Gantut with 42 grams per liter seawater there is something interesting here with the uh, okay, before that was a clear day when when there are clouds then there are more changes in the in the pump in the intensity and you can have issues with the pump shutting down because there's not enough radiation so what happens here there is a, a we, we said before that we don't want the arrow modules to suddenly stop because water will remain inside Okay, what's the, what they do is play with the backwash by keeping the, the permit inside the module when there is not enough power 
there's not the pressure is not high enough to overcome the osmotic pressure, then there is no reverse osmosis. What we have is forward osmosis. So water flows from the permeate side to the feed side and cleans the membrane. So that way, this backflow mitigates the negative effects of intermittent operation, cleaning the membrane and preventing uh, the membrane from clogging from with the salts. Uh, other than that, they also uh, work on short-term fluctuations, controlling them by a hardware using um, pressure storage or even supercapacitors and software as well uh, with algorithms for uh, adaptive control with artificial intelligence. Okay, this is, uh, as I said, the Osmosan technology from Mascara. In this uh, long-term demonstration, I'm, I'm upscaling and they're, I guess they're working on that. There's a very... Uh, new technology and, and we need uh, to see case studies that this is working. But as usual uh, with when PV is is involved, high concentration is 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 not seen. Uh, we want to operate our role with low energy consumption, so with low recovery. So this is complicated for this high recovery RO systems, being the high pressure RO or the osmotically assisted RO for brine concentration, the combination of photovoltaic is more complicated. Then we have solar thermal energy. We can use solar thermal energy directly in solar stills, which are passive systems, very old, the, the ancient uh, uh, travelers of the Mediterranean, the Phoenicians were using them in their ships. It's just based on evaporating water and condensing it on the cover and just passive system but very small and um, limited on size. Uh, this is the first uh, desalination plant uh, in last, uh, no, 19th century in Chile, was based on solar steels, passive system. The problem with solar steel is the low efficiency because the latent heat of condensation is not recovered on the cover. So there's a lot of uh, heat losses and the efficiency is low. So the cheapest, the cheaper the, the process, the better, like, like this, these technologies that go for cheap solutions. There are some advanced uh, technologies uh, like, uh, okay, this is, there are two examples of commercial technologies. This is Italian solver. And here the condensation of, this, of the vapor is not inside the solar steel, but below to decrease the losses. And here is a two effect. So the load latent heat of condensation is recovered by to uh, preheat some water that is used in a second effect at night to try and, and improve the, the performance. But again, the capacity is, is small. You cannot uh, consider solar stills for industrial production. When we want to increase the capacity, we need to use uh, solar energy indirectly using solar heat collectors. And then powered multi-effect distillation, multi-stage flash, humidification, dehumidification, or membrane distillation technologies. Solar, collect, solar thermal collectors absorb solar radiation and convert it into thermal energy. And they can be, uh, they're very varied and basically they're pipes with a, a liquid um, heat transfer medium circulating th through them. Usually it's water. So water is heated in the collectors. There are several collectors. This is the most simple case, just unglazed collectors, which has just black plastic pipes exposed to the sun and the water inside is heated. This is used for warming up uh, swimming pools. With metal, you have higher temperatures, but collectors have a cover. It's just the, you have the tubes and they're covered to decrease, uh, to avoid the convection losses. And this way we can have larger temperatures, 70, even up to 90 degrees with stationary flat plate collectors with a cover. If a vacuum is used to de decrease the losses even more, then the temperature can go higher. And in this case, we can even increase more the temperatures by using a compound parabolic concentrator. Okay, this is still a stationary collector, but has a small parabolic mirror below the pipe to have an, a bit more uh, radiation uh, collected in the pipe. And then uh, it allows to have a slightly more temperature. When we want to increase the temperature, then we concentrate radiation. So it's just not the, radi the incident radiation to the uh, pipe, but all this area is concentrated into the pipe. 
in a small parabolic trough collector to have higher temperature inside this tube. Uh, do you have five, five minutes? OK. Thank you. So uh, in collectors, we, can, we cannot directly heat the, the seawater because we will have scaling. So what we do is we do indirect feed, uh, indirect heating of the feed, having a separate solar collector circuit and a heat exchanger that transfer the heat from the collectors that use uh, uh, that they don't use the sea water inside. They just use a heat transfer fluid, water, as I said, water with maybe anti anti freezing, and then the heat is transferred to the sea water in the heat exchanger. So heat storage is very important because it allows to extend the operation time. It allows to uh, operate at stationary conditions, and a correct dimensioning of the solar field is crucial for proper operation. How do we connect uh, collectors? Well, uh, the, a serious connection of collectors uh, determines the temperature because it is, it's adding heat, and the uh, number of parallel rows uh, determine the total power required by the, the collector's field. When we use this uh, concentration, we can have much higher temperature and we can achieve electricity production with this a concentrated, what we call concentrated solar power. This is typically done uh, with ranking cycles that produce electricity and have waste heat. And the waste heat can be used for the thermal desalination systems. We add uh, thermal vapor compression because we have steam uh, usually as in this waste heat. And yeah, I mentioned this typically a uh, steam ranking cycles. The ranking cycles produce electricity and much uh, a large amount of waste heat. Okay, this is maybe a bit overestimating the, the production, can be 40% is very optimistic. There's a lot of waste heat at low temperatures that can be used for the salination. Like here, replacing the, um, the condenser of the power plant by an MED plant, a low temperature MED plant, or here, they still have the condenser, but uh, some uh, steam extractions are used for a more efficient thermal vapor compression MED plant. There are new uh, technologies based not steam ranking cycles, but air Brayton cycles that have more efficiency and they are cheaper and they can operate at higher temperatures with uh, solar towers with, that have a, focal, a single focal point using um, air or even supercritical CO2. So these Brayton cycles with more efficient have an, an added advantage uh, when we talk about desalination because the combination of desalination and uh, using the waste heat that we saw in the ranking cycles have a penalty on the on the power cycles because the steam is not fully expanded in this case or in this case we are taking steam from the turbine so this is electricity that is not being produced but the waste heat of the air breakdown cycles does not affect the production of electricity so we can use it freely and also is hot air and not steam so we can move hot air and then we don't need to have the desalination plant close to the csp plant whereas when the steam's ranking cycles we need to have them together and you don't want a csp plant close to the sea that's a no-go because of the low radiation so concentrated solar power has uh, another advantage is heat is very easy to store in molten salts so instead of batteries that are expensive and, hard and contaminant, here we have molten salts that are nitrates. They're very uh, freely available. I mean, not free, but very uh, cheap. And this gives dispatchability to CSP power. This is what nuclear energy is claiming, that they can just produce, they switch it on and they produce when there is demand. Okay, this can be done with CSP plants because the heat is stored in the molten salts and they can be switched on whenever there is a demand. So that means that there's a huge opportunity for CSP in the salination. PV is cheaper, fine, but when uses bat using battery, it's more expensive. Currently, we are uh, 10 times more expensive than without batteries. If we look at this uh, levelized cost of electricity of CSP, it's competitive with the levelized cost of electricity of PV with batteries. And it has the advantage that I uh, mentioned before that is dispatchable. So what we, and independent to access of scarce materials uh, that batteries have, and it does not generate contaminant residues because there the are molten salts that are not, uh, they are actually fertilizers. So what we're proposing is the combination of 
I mean, here, the combination of PV and CSP to power the electrical powered uh, technologies, mainly reverse osmosis. So this way we can decarbonize the desalination industry by increasing the um, capacity factor and we can even achieve a 100% capacity factor using the CSP when there is no uh, radiation available because it has been stored, the, the uh, energy has been stored in the molten salts and they can be switched on at night and during the day we can supply with PV. So take, take home messages for large scale solar desalination the need of stereo operation of desalination makes PV complicated and uh, more complicated than using concentrated solar power because storing heat is cheaper and easier. RO based technologies can be powered with hybrid PV and CSP plant for better economic results. And the waste heat from these CSP plants can be used by large scale thermal desalination technologies for brine concentration. In small scale, there are decentralized applications with PVRO uh, available commercially. The challenge is the low efficiency in small size and the use of batteries. Batteries can be avoided, uh, adapting to unsteady operation with digitalization or upscaling short-term storage devices, but the lifetime of membranes and the variable operation is still something that needs to be looked into. We don't have enough experience for, for this uh, operation of RO in variable conditions. The increased recovery is not compatible with batteries use because it's, it's very uh, energy demanding. So here is an opportunity for thermal desalination technologies that are more adaptable to variable operation. And they have the added bonus, bonus of allowing higher brine concentration for valorizing brine in circular economy schemes. There is some innovation needed. Thermal desalination systems are required what we, at the state of the art currently is membrane distillation with multi envelope spiral one modules in vacuum assisted air gap configuration. The technology of aqua steel can have very high recovery and, and with low energy consumption. An alternative is multi effect distillation with polymeric materials, can be MED, MED plant or multi effect multi, uh, membrane distillation systems. We have two companies, CVAB or FCON, working in each case, and also forward osmosis with efficient thermal regeneration of the draw solution. And there are technologies from Trevi system that also have very good thermal energy efficiency and can be coupled with solar energy for these purposes. And finally, let me uh, finish with um, an advantage that MD has compared with other technologies is that the heat can be directly uh, moved into the membrane. The membrane can be heated directly from solar energy saving investment in collectors and reducing the thermal losses. However, there are some disadvantages because the solar collection area is restricted to the membrane area. And uh, in addition, the feed flow rate to increase the temperature in a collector is much lower than the feed flow rate for proper uh, membrane distillation. If we increase the feed flow rate, then the temperature rise is not enough and there's no evaporation. And if we decrease the feed flow rate to have enough temperature rise, then temperature polarization limits the efficiency. So typically when there is a direct uh, coupling of membrane distillation with solar energy, we need some additional membrane surface to heat. And then if we need additional collector surface, then you're not really avoiding the collectors. And then you may go to separate the problems and use collectors and membrane distillation in a separate way. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm open to all the questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Guillermo. It was very interesting and um, comprehensive uh, overview of uh, solar energy and desalination. So you just uh, uh, used it and showed us uh, all problematic that normally problems we maybe we, we are not really aware. So let's uh, have a look at the questions. Um, Yes, there is one from uh, Nicolas Miranda Hernandez. Uh, PEM technologies are proven fast response dynamics for fluctuating input power. What is your opinion on producing green hydrogen with the excess energy from PV after accounting for the desalination process? Yes, that's an interesting concept, uh, using uh, electrolyzers instead of batteries. 
but then the yeah we need to the efficiency of um first the electrolysis and the efficiency of the fuel cells that turn hydrogen into electricity is much lower than the efficiency of current membranes but uh, sorry no of current batteries but it's a very interesting field of work turning the excess pv energy into hydrogen and then the hydrogen into electricity if we increase the efficiency of um, uh, pems and the efficiency of fuel cells to turn hydrogen into electricity then that's a very interesting solution uh, surely less contaminant that than current membranes uh, sorry current uh, batteries batteries okay <laughs> <laughs> it was clear yes <laughs> um so uh, maybe we can wait a few minutes for other questions. There is a, see also a question for Francesca later on. I will, um, I will um, pass to Francesca. And, and just a curiosity uh, from my side, because uh, you know, uh, memory distillation is now, uh, memory operations uh, are quite a lot studied uh, in terms of uh, research and progress because a lot of potentialities and also in the salination for the brine treatment. Uh, often there are many papers uh, uh, coupling uh, MT with solar energy, as you also showed us aqua steel example and so on. So from your, your um, experience, do you think that this uh, combination, solar energy and membrane distillation could be uh, in next future, already available in the desalination plants, so still needs more research, more. Uh, that, no, that, that's all, that's already that's already available. Yeah, there's no yeah. no complications. the The advantage of membrane distillation is that uh, it's easy to start and stop. There's no problem if if yeah, yeah. if the power decreases. There's no problem. As contrary as in our road, there is a problem. You you need to guarantee a certain pressure. With membrane distillation, if there's not heat, then there is no no distillation, no flux. But that's that's not a problem. And um, yeah, solutions are, are in place. It's just coupling uh, thermal uh, collectors with uh, storage, heat storage to operate at, at, to optimize the operation. But even without a storage, you can operate. It. Of course, always not in in the best conditions because mm -hmm. you will be exposed to the fluctuations. Of the temperatures along the day, and and if there are clouds, then the sudden decrease. But uh, that's not a problem for membrane distillation. It's a problem for its efficiency. So here, the buffer, the heat buffer, is not so much a necessity, but uh, for operation, but uh, for having more uh, for optimizing the operation. Okay. But yeah, yes, so... there's uh, there there are no barriers to to operating solar uh, membrane distillation with solar energy in an indirect way using solar collectors and a thermal storage. That's the, it's just the price, of course. This is good news. Okay. Yes. <laughs> if you would, would waste, like waste heat, when you have waste heat available, it's always going to be cheaper. Sure. But, sure. but waste heat is never free. So yeah. And the problem with solar energy is that it has a lot of the investment um, is done at the beginning. Then it can last twenty years, but but you have uh, the upfront of the investment can be the, the the strongest barrier from a commercial point of view because it's, mm -hmm. it's all at the at the beginning. Then operational sure. co operational costs are very low. Sure, thank you. So let's have a look to questions. It seems there are no more questions to you now. I just passed the question uh, to Francesca. Uh, there is a question from Rehan Abdelhamed. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Could I use zeolithic membrane in lithium chloride crystal crystallization? This question is for Professor Francesca. Please, Francesca. Um, okay. Uh, to, to achieve lithium chloride crystallization, what we need as membrane is that uh, the membrane is to be hydrophobic. The average pore size has to be around 0.2 uh, um, uh, micrometer with a very narrow uh, pore size distribution because if you will have some very large large bubble point, you will have problem because you will have wetting. 
Then, about uh, um, zeolite membrane. Uh, until now, some zeolite membrane are used in membrane distillation, uh, membrane distillation for the treatment of seawater and some brine. That, and it seems that the zeolite membrane are, um, at least the tested one, are okay for this process. If you um, then, in principle, zeolite membrane can be used also for uh, decrystallization. Uh, what is uh, um, important in the case of membrane crystallization is uh, then uh, to be sure that uh, your the, the zeolite membrane you are supposed to use is. Um, uh, resistant in the case of lithium chloride is resistant and is stable with high reactive compound and with uh, um, strong basis. Then if your zeolite membrane uh, is not only hydrophobic, not only with uh, average pore size of 0.2 micrometer, but is only but is also uh, resistant, stable when in contact with highly reactive compound, then okay, you can use. Okay, thank you, Francesca. Yeah. I, I see Patricia has a uh, yeah. something maybe to add, I don't know. <laughs> I wanted to ask Guillermo, uh, what do you think about linking geothermal energy with solar energy? Because uh, for membrane distillation, we don't need very high temperature, so it can be always low temperature. The geothermal is always there and it's only pumping. So what do you think? Yeah, well, when there is geothermal available, that's a good opportunity. And uh, it's especially in the combination of solar energy can give a uh, baseline so you have the geothermal uh, energy i don't know to reach 60 degrees and then from 60 to 90 you can use the solar solar energy if you have higher geothermal temperature then uh, even better but mm -hmm. if if capacity yeah, it can help decrease the the solar demand by hybridizing geothermal and solar energy because the, the problem with solar energy is the need of surface to mm -hmm. collect solar radiation. And, uh, and course, yeah, in, the, in the desert, we need, we need a lot of, we have a lot of um, surface, but when you need water, I don't know, when there's scarcity, like in the coast, in islands, then surface is not as, as freely available. And if you can reduce the thermal field with, uh, waste heat or geothermal, yes, much mm -hmm. better. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, I think we are now uh, just uh, at the end of the our Spotlight talk. I would like to thank everybody, the participants, uh, the speakers uh, who shared their expertise with us, and then we could discuss a little bit more about this uh, critical issue about the salination and uh, brine management, energy consumption which are all hot topics and also CO2 capture with uh, Patricia. And um, uh, just uh, information because uh, the, this video should be recorded. So you will, uh, I think Martin can uh, confirm you, you will be uh, able to, to, to see it online when, when it will be ready, of course. And uh, okay, I pass the word to Martin maybe and also the vice president for final remarks. And I would like to thank everybody for for attending. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great session today. Um, the morning session, uh, uh, in the afternoon, we have uh, another session on uh, digitization in, uh, in education and in the coming days, uh, more will follow. Uh, thank you all very much. And I hope you had a great session. Thank you. So sorry, I see some last questions. I don't know. Maybe it's not time. I just uh, they type now. I don't know. Can can we reply or are are we late? We are still online. Yes. Oh, okay. So there because they just type now. Okay. Uh, it, uh, there is a question from Pierre. Uh, Keener, sorry if I wrong. Uh, is there a possibility that initial flight well can be a better solution than PVs for short-term storage? So this is for Guillermo. Okay, I presume that the, he means batteries. 
yes, as an alternative to batteries for short-term storage, yes, uh, like pressure uh, buffers or inertial flywheels, uh, yeah, they can be used, uh, especially in the case, in this case when we want to convert electricity into mechanical energy or pressure. Yeah, that's that's a possible alternative. Okay, thank you. And then this is a more general question. Good morning. Thank you for all the presentations. I would like to ask if it's possible to get a certificate attesting the participation to the webinar for PhD students. Thank you in advance. So I don't know, Martin, if it's possible to do that or, or we should do it as section. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I will do it. No problem. Okay. okay. Thank you. So. But then I would recommend that the persons who would like to have such a certificate direct specifically an email to Martina Poo. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So thank you, everybody, and have a nice day, and uh, see you soon somewhere on the web yeah. or in person. Okay. Yes. You Bye. too. Bye. Thank you.